way back when I was kind of a kind of a rookie getting into the investing game, you know, building a being a real estate agent into my early 30s and then mid 30s I had an opportunity to, to acquire a home via owner financing. And we did a 6 month balloon. Hmm. Okay? I know, and you're thinking, "Wow, yeah. you're you probably have listeners right now screaming and laughing at me because I agreed to a 6 month balloon payment, but I was for the life of me, I was assured in my head that this lady would allow me to refinance because yeah. the intent was I was going to to put it under finance, owner financing. I was going to package it up and then sell it, and then she would get her money, I'd get my money, and everybody would go about their way. Well, it didn't really happen that way. It, we couldn't sell it, and so I ended up uh, putting our tenant in there and then going to her and asking to refinance, and she flat out refused. Ooh. Now she got an attorney involved. The attorney filed a lawsuit, yep. and I had to write the attorney a, a giant check, and I still had to buy the home. Oof. So I had to go get regular financing to buy the home. Yeah. And so I, I really hope that lady died of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or something very painful. Welcome to the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. And now your hosts, Stephen White and Eric Worrell. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Rent Prep for Landlords. So recently, I was having a conversation with a regular guest here on the podcast, Andrew Schultz, who's a property manager here in Buffalo, New York. And he was telling me about a podcast that he was listening to and picking up some great insights from. It's called the Property Management Mastermind Podcast. And today, we have a guest that's with us. His name is Brad Larson, and he's the host of that podcast. How you doing, Brad? I'm great. Thanks for having me on, guys. Yeah, of course. And uh, Brad, you got a few things going on. I mean, if anybody's watching the video, you got a few different companies uh, focused behind you. We already mentioned the podcast. You also have, it's a uh, property management company. Is it Rentworks? Correct. Got a property management company here in San Antonio, Texas. We currently manage about 850 plus single family homes with a good track to get to about 1,000 to 1,100 by the end of the year. So we've had some good growth in the last couple of years. Yeah. And then you also have your realtor's license as well, correct? Right. Been a real estate broker since 2005, uh, an agent since 2003. Good story there. I moved to town uh, after getting out of the military and got here on a Sunday night and was in real estate school Monday morning. And that was in 2003. <laughs> and, uh, you know, 15 plus years later, I've still been able to keep the license. And I've, you know, sold a lot of homes through the career, but then focused more on the property management game several years ago. I'm kind of curious. What, what got you into it? I mean, it sounds like you already knew that you wanted to get into it when you got out of the military. Did somebody put the bug in your ear or what happened with that? Yeah, one of the things we talked about in the in the pre-show was uh, what was one of the most influential books, and it was the Rich Dad series. And so to maybe kind of steal some of the questions you're going to ask me later on, during that uh, intervention, I would almost call it, it was in uh, 2000, stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia as an infantry officer, uh, young captain, you know, I was 26 years old, and just kind of figuring out, I'm going to either go lifelong in the Army and play, you know, careerist, you know, or you're going to do something different. Because I always thought it's either going to be four or 34, four years or 34 years. It's right. not going to be 12 and get out. So after the, the three-year mark, I was there, there at the Captain's Career Course, and he handed me a book. It's Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, and read it and just kind of completely changed the mindset of what I wanted to do. And that led me to leave, uh, leave the military a year later, you know, got out on good terms and all that good stuff. Uh, right before 9-11, really kicked off as far as, uh, us invading Afghanistan and getting into that point. So I missed that whole window of having to go play, uh, play in the sandbox and get shot at. But that led me to San Antonio and got me right into real estate thinking that I wanted to own apartments and I wanted to own single family homes and be a big time, you know, ownership person, but you got to make a living, right? Mm-hmm. So you got to get to that point where you can start acquiring those assets. And, you know, one of the things I've really enjoyed is listening to you guys and talking about all those issues of owning, managing, and acquiring assets. It's been very exciting to hear. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the first things we'd like to start off with, uh, you did uh, steal a question from later in the podcast. We'll I get to that. I apologize for that. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's a big tease for the audience listening right now. <laughs> <laughs> so we're uh, doing this new segment. It's kind of a new old segment. Steve uh, used to do it in the past. It's called In the News. Yeah. And uh, we got three uh, news articles all from the last week here. They've kind of come out. And just want to kind of get your guys' take on these uh, these current topics. You know, I was thinking about it the other day, and it was I, know, I remember the article specifically that created this category in the news. It was an article that I came across. It was on like a major headline website, and uh, and it was a landlord that was cutting a hole, a circular hole in the floor of this building in San Francisco because they wanted the tenants to leave. 
So they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. So you've heard of like shutting off the utilities, lockouts, things like that. They took it a step further. And all I can picture in my mind was like an old school cartoon. Yeah, that's what I was Where picturing. like Bugs Bunny cuts the hole in the floor and the guy, you know, like Elmer Fudd falls through or something. Anyway, that's all I think about when we think of in the news is that article. And I was like, this is so crazy. What are landlords thinking? And you know what I mean? And like, so in the news is a great segment to be able to teach landlords a lot of times. Uh, don't follow your urges and, and think that something crazy is a great idea. Like cutting a hole in the floor. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, now that we got that backstory. From yeah, the news, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Had to think of it. The first uh, article that I found here is actually um, from urbanmilwaukee.com. And it's talking about changes for Wisconsin landlords. So there's a bit here to read off. So I'll go through all this and then we'll kind of recap a little bit. So this is Assembly Bill 771. And it prohibits local governments from reinspecting rental property for at least five years. They're also looking to limit the violations that landlords can be cited for uh, when it comes to health and safety items rather than aesthetics. They want to limit the amount of time to 10 days that courts can prevent tenants, such as domestic violence victims, from being evicted. Uh, currently, it's much longer than that. Uh, they also want to prohibit local governments from inspecting rental property that is less than eight years old. <laughs> in addition to that, they want to require renters with disabilities to have medical documentation in order to have a task or emotional support animal. I'm sure that one will be a fan favorite of our Wisconsin landlords. Yeah. Uh, they also uh, want to make renters' eviction records available to the public for at least 10 years, which, Ooh, yeah, yeah. That, that one I thought was really interesting. Yeah. Uh, and loosen state renovation standards for landlords with historic buildings, which we actually talked about yep. last week's podcast. Yep. And raising the maximum amount a landlord can charge for a uh, prospective tenant to run a uh, consumer credit report from $20 to $25. So, yeah. Steve, which ones that you were uh, ooh and on about that kind of uh, stuck out to you? All of these. So Wisconsin's been known, especially because of their uh, their application fee, right? The, mm -hmm. the $20 application fee limit. That's one of the most strict states in the country to, to put limitations on that. To me, this screams of like landlords finally got together in Wisconsin, paid a lobbyist, and finally got some of this stuff to at least be acknowledged that these are changes that need to be made and try to push the tide a little bit the other way because Wisconsin is such a tenant-friendly state tenant friendly in the sense that it's not landlord friendly, right? It's never landlord mm -hmm. friendly. So there's a handful of stuff in there expanding the evictions. I mean, Brad, I'm sure you could admit uh, eviction data is probably one of the most key pieces of information you can find when you're screening a tenant. Absolutely it is. And what, what we've been doing here is we, we tie into TransUnion and TransUnion actually offers you a credit history report along with the tenant history report. Yep. Uh, the, the tenant uh, leasing report. So that's going to be an interesting thing if, to look into further. Is that going to allow more of that information being given to all three credit agencies? Is something else going to stand up to say, you know, we're the, the, the place in Wisconsin to go to to give people more information about their renter history? Right. The thing that I really want to talk about in this one, this is really standing out in my mind, is requires renters with disabilities to have medical documentation in order to have a task or emotional support animal. Yeah. This is trying to overshadow the national law right now with uh, federal fair housing and yep. going into emotional support animals and HUD. Yep. Boy, this is, this is touchy because now you have a state trying to circumvent or what, what's the term, you know, overshadow would be another term yep. of a federal law that's in standing and this is going to cause some challenges. I mean, this is going to be some issues here because the HUD guidelines are very vague, mm -hmm. intentionally vague and gray as far as requiring renters to show medical documentation. Right. Because you are essentially asking a tenant, we want to know why you're crazy. Right. Right. <laughs> Think about it. Mm -hmm. And, and if, I'm a, if I'm a PTSD veteran, I don't want to tell people I'm crazy. Right. But I need a I need a support animal to, you know, make me feel better. I've got all kinds of VA documentation that I could show you, but it's embarrassing for me to show that to you. And I'm not saying it's me. I'm just right. using an example because we're in Military City USA here in San Antonio. We get a lot of that stuff. Right. And we're dealing with a lot of emotional support animal issues. And for the state to come in and say that, it basically says they're throwing out all the HUD guidelines and HUD laws, and I don't like it. Yeah, I think uh I think what the what they're trying to achieve or what I imagine they're trying to achieve. So I don't know if you've run into this in the properties that you're managing. Um, there's been a big push recently for these online certifications. So these are people who have never seen a medical professional. They're paying the 
what is it like 200 bucks online or 150 yeah, 200 yeah. bucks around there so they're paying to get an online certificate and they've never seen a medical professional they've never this isn't medically required and let's be honest what it really is at the end of the day for a lot of what's happening the abuse at least that's happening is that these are people who have pets and want to get the pets in there you know mm-hmm. what i mean and in in a and override the 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 landlord's no pet policies in a lot of cases and it's a shame because it does you know it it dilutes the people that need the actual you know the care of somebody who's got PTSD or somebody who has a genuine you know issue that needs to have these animals it's the classic case of a you know a bad apple ruining the bunch i think there's enough fraud going on out there that they're they're backtracking now to try to limit that and figure out how to deal with that um the trap here that people could fall into is asking for certain documentation and asking it in the wrong way. Sure. Oh, yeah. You, you guys know this yep. you know, better than anybody is if one of your staff members in an offhanded comment says something wrong, right? They, that could be held against the entire company or, the, or that landlord in a conversation that's being secretly recorded right. says something wrong or asks something wrong. That can be thrown against them pretty quick. And so it's it's very scary and I'm wondering what you guys are seeing out there for any sort of solutions or guidelines as far as how would you recommend one of your prospective landlords screen a tenant? Is there anything sure. you recommend for that? Yeah, I think specifically with, especially with pets, animals, we've had an attorney on the podcast that made it really clear that landlords need to use the proper nomenclature in this case, which would be animals, not pets, because that mm-hmm. covers it all. That runs, you know, the whole, whether it be a mini horse, which is which can be a surface animal or whether it be a cat or a dog or a parakeet, doesn't matter. It's an animal and they have guidelines around it. And, and um, you know, it's like anything you put it in your lease, they agree to it. It's binding. And as long as you're playing within the fair housing guidelines, but a landlord can ask for proper documentation, not to necessarily release what the medical issues you have are, but just to know that a local medical professional did in fact give you this, this script, right. Versus getting it off of some online website. Um, and so we see landlords that are kind of preventative in that way of just preparing ahead of time. And they're putting these addendums in place, even if they sign a lease without a person having an animal, this, this covers them in the event that six months into a year lease or whatever, or two months in, if they all of a sudden say, Hey, I want to get this dog. Um, great. You know, you sign the addendum, you got to show me the documentation or show, or whatever it is that on the addendum that you have on there. But I think landlords have to have a game plan going into it and not be reactionary. I think a lot of times landlords get themselves into trouble when they're reacting to it. Mm-hmm. And especially if they feel like they're being taken advantage of or their policy is being disregarded, um, well, then you have problems. You brought up these online websites. Uh, I know the one, I think it's like certipet.com, which I don't feel bad throwing their, uh, their website out there because it's all landlords listening. I'm not going to give them some free advertising, but <laughs> when you land on there, it's got a slider on the top of the homepage. And one of them says, don't want to pay a pet deposit, get, oh, <laughs> get one of our like, yes, forms. It's dirty. Yeah. So it's like, they're not even like, you know, beating around the bush. Like that's not nothing to do with a disability. They're just, you know, right. speaking, the. Uh, Right. Speaking to the need of their uh, customer base. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, One of the things I wanted to ask about this article, so give me some uh, Wisconsin history. Were they doing landlord certification for these homes on a yearly annual basis? Because now they said they're going to adjust it to five years. Were they charging a fee and doing an inspection every year in Wisconsin? I'm pretty sure both. I'm pretty sure they were charging a a fee, a registration fee um, to register as a landlord. And then they were doing annual inspections. And one, I don't know how they could execute on that. I don't think they could. I mean, yeah. they're probably charging a fee, but there's no way you can execute on an actual inspection for hundreds of thousands of units on an annual basis right. on, mm-hmm. by a state entity who has probably two dudes or three dudes in some right. back office. Right. So that's smart. And then obviously they're doing it for revenue generation, which is hokey and more government than I like. Yep. You know, here in Texas, we're very loose as far as that. It's a very landlord friendly state. We're not the, the tenant state as, as some other states are. Mm-hmm. So it's, Kind of good and bad. I mean, I, I see some strong ideas for more government in certain ways, more regulation. But more along the lines, I'd like to see more regulation on property managers. Not so much landlords. I'd like yeah. to see a lot more regulation on the property management industry. But that's, you know, another conversation. Potentially. Right. Yeah. And uh, Steve did hit the nail on the head. Uh, the congressman who uh, passed this uh, bill through, uh, he uh, he's received a couple million dollars 
in um, donations from mm-hmm. the Realtor Association in Wisconsin and a few other key uh, landlords and property management companies. So, oh yeah. yeah, I've I've sat on boards. I know how this I know how this business works. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, let's move on to our next uh, news topic here. We have a story that's coming out of Anchorage, Alaska, and this comes from ADN.com. So in Anchorage, the uh, largest private property manager and a nonprofit housing authority have forged an unusual partnership to provide apartments, job training, and case managers to 40 homeless households, a model they say could be replicated in other states if successful. With a fund of more than a half a million dollars amassed from a wide range of prominent donors, Widener Apartment Homes and Cook Inlet Housing Authority plan to run a one-year test project that opens up empty apartments to some of the city's lower-risk homeless adults, young adults, and families. So what do you guys think about when you hear this? If I may jump in first, yeah, this looks like Section 8 on steroids to me. Yeah. And that would be my kind of a synopsis of reading that article. And and it's only for 40-some families or, or residences. I mean, we're not talking a major... 400,000 unit type campaign, right? It's one little complex in, in one city. And I, I don't think it's even that big of a news story necessarily, but it's interesting to see that you get nonprofit and the state kind of combining in efforts to create some sort of housing solution for these folks. It's interesting. Well, let's hope that Alaska doesn't have more than 40 homeless people, because that has got to be the worst possible place to be homeless. And I'm not trying to make a joke, but if I'm going to be homeless, I'm going down south to be homeless and be, you well, know. You spent a lot of time in Alaska, Yeah, right? let's go to, go yeah. to San Diego. They welcome homeless people there in San Diego. We had our last conference there in January. And, uh, man, you couldn't swing a dead cat without hitting a homeless person there outside of the hotel. It was disgusting. Yeah, I, I, I got to imagine that, um, you know, that this this is probably a pilot program they're trying to test out. I know that um, a couple of years back I worked with a – a nonprofit in San Francisco that had a similar concept um, to try to provide housing and sort of a rehabilitation, you know, where they're giving job training and things. Did they say that they were training them to do property management or am I just making that up? I didn't see that part. I think they're just kind of trying to offer some job training to okay. some young adults. All right. Cause that, that would actually be kind of interesting if they were specific and like, Hey, we're going to teach you how to, you know, we're going to get you certified in property management and, uh, you know, set them on a legitimate career path of like, hey, you can, you know, I don't know. I feel like that's at least a better plan other than just blanketed in general job training. But I can certify you guys in property management. However, comma, you'll have to pay me at least four hundred dollars each. Ooh. Then I can yeah. certify you. I'll just give you the sign of the cross and you are now certified. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like to say in New York here, it's like, what was it, like two hundred hours or something? Because we, look, we looked into it, like, the educational purposes, and it was, like, thousands of dollars and a couple hundred hours, and you had to spend, like, uh, so many hours uh, kind of doing an apprenticeship under somebody. and Yeah, you have to have a sponsor. Is that the same thing in Texas? you got to be sponsored by a property manager? I, I wish. That would be awesome to have some of that stuff because we have way too many clowns doing property management here sure. in the state. Sure. And it's a real shame because you have a lot of trust money flying around. I mean, yeah. millions of dollars of security – Security deposit trust money on behalf of tenants that's being flowed out there. Mm-hmm. You don't need any sort of license. Yeah. All you need is a real estate license. Right. And any realtor can do property management. It's very scary. And so I'd like to see some more of that. So I'd, I'm kind of curious about what you're talking about. Is that in New York that they're doing 2,000 yeah. hours or, or of apprenticeship? That's well, I think it was a couple thousand dollars and then it was like a couple hundred hours of like – between the classes and then the apprenticeship program, it maybe it was like 50 hours you had to spend working with a uh, property management company that was certified to like partner of this program. Plus and, a continuing education piece mm-hmm. of it that was annually where you had to do a certain amount of uh, continuing education hours in order to recertify year over year, maybe every other year, something like so that. So let me ask you this. What kind of uh, penetration does the property management industry see in the New York area? Are you, are you getting, you know, 50 to 60 percent of owners that own single family homes, are they employing a property manager or do you have any idea on that type of a, a number? I don't know in New York because New York City skews our numbers. You know, we're upstate. Yeah. So you have to it, kind of throw that out of there, too. Yeah. I really wish they would just make that its own state eventually because it just messes our whole entire state up. Mm-hmm. But I don't know from the cross section. I mean, this is nothing official, but just from what we know. I would say the majority don't use property management, individual landlords, that is. Yeah. 
you know. And I'll I, give you some background on that because uh, in Australia, for example, as a parallel, they're getting 70 to 80 percent penetration. Wow. So if you if you own a single family home in Australia, it's going to be probably eight out of ten, four out of five. You are employing a property manager. Wow. Uh, you go to cocktail parties and you are the one person in the room that doesn't work with a property manager. They look at you like you have something grown out of your head. And what's the what's the what's the reasoning? Is it because they want they want regulation. it to be a- regulation? It's yeah. hugely oh. regulated. It's a completely ah. very tenant focused nation. Sure. I mean, sure. they they joke and they say tenants are per, are protected species over yeah. there. Right, uh, right. You can't charge fees. You can't charge. You can't evict hardly. I mean, it's it's a real real yeah. challenge over there. And so, in parallel, the numbers are exactly switched here in the states. We're looking at about an average of thirty percent penetration into the market, to where the again ten landlords at home that have single family homes, only three of them are going to employ a property management company. Wow. And so, we would like to see more regulation to one eliminate bad property managers, and regulation on two two different folds. Uh, bad property managers try to get them out of the game and then also to encourage landlords to use us, which, which is probably the wrong term. But if they're, if you're seeing more regulation by the state, like Wisconsin is putting on, mm-hmm. that's going to push people to just use a property manager. It goes back to the home Depot concept. Uh, you walk in and say, I want to build a deck. And they say, yeah, you do this, 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 this. And they give you a list of 20 things and 50 things to buy. And you just throw up your hands and say, all right, who can I write a check to, to build me a deck? Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a great point. And I, we see a lot of landlords get themselves into some pretty hot water and, and, and into trouble by winging it, thinking they know what they, they're doing. And uh, everyone's a successful landlord until you've hit your first lawsuit or discrimination suit or whatever. And then all of a sudden everything changes. So, yeah, for a lot of landlords, and we talk to landlords here all the time where we tell them, you're better off going to find a property management company. Go find somebody that manages these properties. You are not meant to manage properties. If you want to be an investor, great. but the actual day-to-day management of these properties, it's not your strength. Yeah. I just saw something on Bigger Pockets the other day, and I responded this morning. There was a, a gentleman who made a comment about renting to military folks, uh, service members. Mm-hmm. And they, they say it's great, and I'm a prior service guy, and I think one of you, one of you are as well. Mm-hmm. They say, oh, it's great to rent to military because you can just go to their chain of command if they don't pay. Well, really, you can't because that's violating a ton of privacy laws that they do fall into. Right. And you could be essentially hurting them. Right. You could be hurting their, their security clearance. You could be hurting their reviews just by mentioning one thing that may not be fact. Right. You know, there could be a simple misunderstanding of a rent check and now you're calling somebody's first sergeant or their commander and, and complaining about them. That could turn around on an owner really quick and they can go after that owner with a lawsuit sure. because that could, that could affect their job. Right. Mm-hmm. That, that's not really something you can do unless you get a court order. Right, right. So anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there just for fun conversation. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good point because I think we've actually, I've seen that come up in the group and maybe even on the podcast. I've talked with you before about that. Yeah. But like if you think of somebody like a school teacher or something, you wouldn't, you know, go to their school and talk to the principal right. and say, hey, so-and-so is doing this. But for some reason, that is a uh, idea that comes up a lot with military. Well, I think the person's got it way out of order. I don't think... I. Brad's 100% right. I mean, it's totally inappropriate for them to go to their chain of command if they're late on the rent. However, if it comes down to a judgment situation, like let's say they have to evict somebody, they obtain a judgment. I think just by nature, that's going to eventually, you know, sit before somebody in their chain of command. I'm not saying that they go through and send it through the process, but at some point, you know, if you have legal action being taken against you, you know, that service member is going to reach out to their branch of service for either help with a, you know, JAG officer, or military officer, somebody mm-hmm. to help them or represent them in that situation. So, yeah, if there's a judgment on the table that's been that's gone through the courts and been yeah. executed, then there's complete justification to contact that chain of command because yeah. the person may be gone, might be missing. Right. Right. You never know. I mean, if they're not paying rent, why are they not paying rent? They didn't show up to court. They didn't show up to court. Right. So you want to reach out to their chain of command because that money is gov- is coming through the government. They're right. getting a housing allowance. Yep. And so, yeah, if there's a judgment on the table, man, it's it's open season there to, yep. to try and track them down. But if you're if they're late on the rent for yeah. five days, there's no call to be trying to track them down. Oh, just call their commander and get it fixed. Yeah. Inappropriate. Totally inappropriate. I, I agree. That's equivalent to, yeah, you're going to call their – they work at a dentist office and all of a sudden you're calling the dentist saying, hey, do you know Judy didn't pay your rent this month? <laughs> the dentist is going to say, what the, the hell do I care? What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. All right. Well, moving to our next uh, in the news story here. This comes from mercurynews.com. And it's about the fact that landlords are suing the city of San Jose. So a group of San Jose landlords is pushing back against a new city registry for rent control departments, claiming in a lawsuit that requiring them to turn over a wealth of tenant information is illegal. The property owners, which are about 20 individuals in a group known as the Small uh, Small Property Owners Association San Jose, sued the city late last week in U.S. District Court for Northern California to stop the new requirements that are part of a rent stabilization measure. The suit widens the rift between landlords and the city over new regulations designed to curb rapid rent increases in an overheated residential housing market. Hmm. So what do you guys think of when you hear that? Yeah, Brad, what are your thoughts if somebody, if the government stepped in and say, hey, we want your client list or your tenant list and how much they're paying? I would say you got to show me a court order. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) and this is getting into the point of a, the renter state concept that we keep hearing floating around uh, a couple of the advisors that work for the property management mastermind show, particularly Scott Brady is one of them that really talks about it. And he's in California managing properties now in four or five different market centers. And they just see more and more of this rent control really starting to invade what's going on, making it a bad situation for everybody. Mm-hmm. And so this is, this is causing a major disparity between the haves and the have nots even more and then for the government to come in and say you have to start sharing things, it's getting a little little weird. And again, it goes back to that conversation with, about the military folks is it's an invasion of privacy. You have privacy concerns there and a state might be overstepping their bounds to even mention it. Yeah, I feel like, man, people have problems with uh, Facebook taking your private information. Imagine if your landlords now are handing over private information or handing over applications or whatever the hell they're going to hand over. It seems... That to me seems like a major invasion of privacy that's not protecting the tenants at all. It's doing nobody a favor in that situation. If they're trying to collect data, there's better ways to do that. Yeah, and that's kind of what it looks like. They're trying to just collect data by, you know, basically a post mortem survey. Yeah. Uh, when a tenant vacates, I mean, to demand it, require it, pass a law, pass an ordinance is a bit over the top. I mean, there's better ways to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. California's a it is a weird market right now in uh, in the rental market, you know, and it started sort of in San Francisco a few years ago. We saw the writing on the wall. It would be it was sort of the epicenter. We had landlords that realized they were undercharging two, three times the amount of rent they, they could have gotten because of the tech industry booming there. Mm-hmm. And then they started doing crazy stuff to push out existing tenants and get the new tenants in so they could start charging more. I understand some of it, though, like uh, one of the things I was reading was um how many homeless teachers there are in the San Francisco market. Wow. Because you think about that, it's like, how would you on a teacher's salary afford housing there? Unless you, I guess you'd have to live really far out, but for the teachers that are teaching downtown San Francisco, I mean, you can't be within 30 minutes of that place and not be paying, you know, thousands a month in rent. Like you got to live pretty, pretty poor. And what they're finding is that they're having trouble keeping teachers because of this. Cause they're like, why am I going to teach in San Francisco if I got to live, you know, with three other teachers in a one bedroom apartment. So that is exact truth. I brother-in-law and my wife's brother and wife's sister-in-law, they all live in the San Francisco area there and they have to commute. Chad, his name is Chad. He's got to commute in an hour and a half, 90 minutes, one way to go work into the city. And it's not by choice. I mean, they would really like to live closer, but there's no place else to, right. to get out and to where you can have a decent place to live. Uh, it's an affordability issue. It's a livable issue. So it's a 90 minute commute in 90 minute commute out. And they have to, he has to take the BART, which is the Bay area rapid transit to get in and out of there. Right. And they make a pretty good salary and he did pretty well. I mean, not great, but you know, really well in the, in the tech industry and she's a teacher. Right. And, and so, yeah, they, they can't afford to live in and around the San Francisco area. And I know a lot of property managers that work in that San Francisco Bay area and it's, you know, they do very well uh, mm-hmm. because everything is thrown off by proportion and what they manage to what they, they gain in. But to hear the rent control stories, guys, it, it would really yeah. it'd make your skin crawl, especially if you're a landlord or yep. uh, any sort of business person. It's just to hear the state come in or the city come in and say, you can't do this, you can't do that, and you have to do this and you have to do that. It really just makes you want to want to get out of that entire environment. Yeah, so if, if we're looking at, like, let's say San Francisco specifically, if that's a bubble and all bubbles pop eventually, what is the what is the 
the fallout look like? Like what is what does overregulation look like on the back end? What does do they push back like Wisconsin? Do you think that's going to happen, Brad? Where eventually it starts becoming more landlord friendly, or or you know swinging one way or the other, or is this the beginning of the end and and there's going to be just you know areas where it's going to be government controlled everything in terms of uh, rent? I think a little bit of the both because there is no. I mean, when is the bubble going to burst? Is it going to be? It's going to be a bigger factor than just the San Francisco market or any other rent control markets. It's going to be a na- national or international factor. If uh, mm-hmm. something really bad happens, like I don't even want to speculate, but you can see where I'm going. Yeah. To where the economy com- takes a complete shift. Right. That might burst that bubble a little bit, but again, the state may have to come in and or the local ordinances may have to change to to let it run its course. And what's going to happen, sadly, is that if it does run its course, no one that does anything will live there. Mm -hmm. So you will have more teachers living in a car to try and afford to teach in the inner city. Everybody at Starbucks will not afford to be able to live in San Francisco that works at Starbucks. So what are you going to what's going to have to happen is the cost of labor is going to have to go down or people are going to have to shift more towards out of the city or they're going to have to go up. And that's always been a, there was a comment below in that article that more high rises have to be built yeah. and you're going to get into a situation where you start having really disgusting high rises being built, like in, you know, some of the major cities, New York city, where they get built up and then they get abandoned Yeah, right? mm-hmm. because no one wants or, to live. There. They're so bad. I just read an article specifically about San Francisco too, and about the high rises and, and them saying like, what a potential disaster this could be if you, with earthquakes and all kinds of things. Like, I don't want to be in a place with the highest amount of sky pr- skyscrapers per capita on the day that there's an earthquake, you know, like mm-hmm. that's going to be, uh, it's especially be, if their buildings are not, you know, putting a lot of money into as far as the way they're being built. Let's just, yeah, let's build them quick because we need it. And mm-hmm. you know, you're slapping it together. I don't know if that's possible to slap a skyscraper together, but I don't know. Yeah. When you play Sims, it's like that. You just like Jenga. Yeah. Well, let's hope nothing like that happens. That seems like a disaster waiting to happen. So, yeah, I, I don't know if you thought the same thing as me, but when uh, Brad said when the economy takes a shift, I was like, oh, yeah. that's not what I thought he was going to say. Yeah, I thought yeah. we were going to an R-rated podcast <laughs> here for a second. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time for three quick questions. All right, Brad, uh, I got three questions that I uh, sent you before the podcast here. So we're going to do a little segment called three quick questions. Let's get started with the uh, first one here, which we kind of addressed a little bit earlier, but what is the book or books you've given out most as a gift and why, or what are the one to three books that have greatly influenced your life? Great question. So I wrote that down. Uh, my favorite book to give out to my staff members have been Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. Uh, it's a great audiobook as well. And what you want to do is you kind of read that and understand it. I've listened to it over and over. I listened to it this morning when I was running and just kind of listening to how you run a business and scale up. And it can apply to any, any, any facet. If you're looking to own 10 properties, one property, 1,000 properties, uh, if you want to be a, if you're building a business, I really like that. And I've actually given that out several times, a book called Scaling Up by Vern Harnish. The most influential books we talked about already with Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad, Poor Dad series, really kind of changes your mindset. I'm sure anybody who's listening who's a landlord, entrepreneur, they've all listened to that or heard it or know of it. Uh, you know, the funny thing about the podcast you know, if you listen to Kiyosaki on his podcasting, the world is coming to an end, right? <laughs> the sky is falling. Yeah. And I, I love listening to him, but it's just a little bit down for me. Uh, I'm a bit more positive than that, but you know, that might, I might get good audiences to, to listen and pay attention. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, the news isn't really positive, you know, and there's a reason for that for those ratings, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. All right. Uh, moving on to question number two here. What is the one purchase of $100 or less that has greatly helped you as a property manager or investor? Great question there. Uh, and I wrote down in the answer is uh, we use a lead source called All Property Management to generate leads for our property management business. And I first started in 2012 doing that. And it's called All Property Management. And my third lead from there cost me $80 was an investor who owns 14 homes. And he's owned as many as 16. So he went from 8 or 10 up to 14 to 16. And now we manage about 13, 14 of his homes still today. And so that's been one of the best things I've ever spent money on. Because imagine the the revenue that he's helped uh, our company generate sure. by management fees and commissions and 
and we keep them really happy. Don't trust me on that. We, we keep them real happy. And that was the best $80 I've ever spent. Yeah. Uh, my favorite audio book along, along those same lines to, to gift an audio book or have somebody, you know, listen to something along those lines. I really like the 40 hour work year with Scott Fritz. Again, it's a, it's a mindset of building a business with an exit in mind, and that can apply to anything you're doing. Uh, you know, you've always heard the term, uh, start with the exit in mind, correct? I mean, there's a paraphrase that's better around that. I really think that's a good listen as well. I don't really have like a, a you know, the best $89 I spent was for a widget, right? I, I you know, the right. widgets are kind of, you know, the, 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 the items are kind of tough to quantify as far as having any real value on that. I'll have to kind of see what you guys think. Can one of you answer that question for me? Well, one of the uh, good ones we got on that was from, uh, I think it was a rental rookie podcast was on, and they were saying the uh, Mile IQ, uh, an app for uh, tracking your mileage. I know okay. he had said that he had put on thousands and thousands of miles, and it kind of automates the process, and the paid version of it's like 60 bucks or something like that a year. Yeah, and he, what, quadrupled his return because the money oh, yeah. that he in deductions that he had for taxes that he wasn't deducting years prior. Yep. Another good one. Uh, I think uh, I'm trying to think of his name at the rent to own labs. Uh, Marty or, or mm -hmm. I think is yep. how you say his name. He has a uh, premium account on uh, Evernote and he uses Evernote to uh, take all of his photos and organize all of his move in, move out inspections and all of that information. And he says it's worked wonders for him as far as organization. So yeah, I think sometimes though you can get a little, especially myself, like working in marketing, it's super easy to get obsessed with widgets and like new, like, you know, software and stuff like that. And then you spend all this time with it and you realize, you know what, like I probably would have been better off just buying a book and learning something new and, you know, just, <laughs> I, I like shiny objects. Yeah. You have shiny object syndrome. Big time. I do too though. Yeah. All right. Uh, question number three here. How has a failure or apparent failure set you up for a later success? Do you have a favorite failure of yours? I mentioned three of them, and so I guess one that would apply to you guys, especially in this podcast, is I mentioned I call it the Chisholm Creek Owner Finance Failure Story, right? And that was the title of it. And so I just wrote a note to kind of refresh myself on this. On this, so way back when I was kind of a kind of a rookie getting into the investing game, you know, building a being a real estate agent into my early 30s, and then mid 30s, I had an opportunity to, to acquire a home via owner financing. And we did a six month balloon. Hmm. Okay. I know. And you're thinking, wow, yeah. you're, you probably have listeners right now screaming and laughing at me because I agreed to a six month balloon payment. But I was, for the life of me, I was assured in my head that this lady would allow me to refinance because yeah. the intent was I was going to, to put it under finance, owner financing. I was going to package it up and then sell it. And then she would get her money. I'd get my money and everybody would go about their way. Well, it didn't really happen that way. We couldn't sell it. And so I ended up uh, putting our tenant in there and then going to her and asking to refinance, and she flat out refused. Oof. Now she got an attorney involved. The attorney filed a lawsuit, yep. and I had to write the attorney a, a giant check, and I still had to buy the home. Oof. So I had to go get regular financing to buy the home. Yeah. And so I, I really hope that lady died of uh, Lou Gehrig's disease or something very painful. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> but that was a, a huge lesson learned. Oh. Don't assume you're going to be able to refinance down the road if yeah. you do an owner financing because you can get caught, you know, the it's like musical chairs when you get caught with the, without enough chairs to sit in and you're going to be the last person standing. Yep. That was a lesson learned. Uh, another one is I mentioned in there was a business development manager story. And that was a failure on my part because we hired a business development manager to go out and obviously do more biz dev stuff as you guys were just talking about. Mm -hmm. And we ended up offering a guy a straight commission role and that, that built up over time. So what happened is we built up his commissions over time and he was making a ton of money. I mean, way more than he should have been paid yep. double or even more of the market average for any sort of business development person. And so we went and had to readjust his pay. Uh, he ended up quitting Mm -hmm. uh, or I fired the guy rather. And then he recorded the conversations we had and yeah. tried to sue us. It was just a really bad situation. So yeah. lesson learned is don't get into a situation where you're paying straight commission where it builds yep. over time. It's got to be a salary and an end state commission. Yep. Uh, and then assume in any sort of negotiation with employees, assume they're recording you. 
Yeah. That's... Hey, I don't I don't know if I like that though because I've been recording Steve actually right now. <laughs> I've got a couple recorders in his office. You've so. secretly recorded me, and I'm okay with it. I feel like, but 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 Brad, uh, so, oh man, you and I I could go on and on with stories because uh, I I feel like you and I have chewed a lot of the same dirt and far as far as lessons learned. I did. I had the exact same situation. Commission employees, um, ten ninety nine employees that have come around over ten years, and, and you know, of uh, doing this at some point it bites you. And uh, man, those are hard lesson learns. They really are. But you do learn them, and you, and you from that day on, you think never again, never ever again. Hmm. So our biz dev guy we just hired uh, asked me, what you know, is there going to be any commissions? I said, absolutely not. <laughs> I said, no, <laughs> no way, no. Work hard, you get a salary like everyone else. We'll have a yeah. yearly review, no commissions. It doesn't work out for anybody in the end. So, yeah, anybody out there that's in the early stages of your business, that seems like an attractive uh, option because it, it gives you, the business owner, the ability to have that flexible, scalable pay. But, man, I swear to you, it's 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 just worth it to come up with a different structure in the end because, it again, it's it, it never ends well. I've never seen it go go well. Right. When it did adjust, we rehired and we've hired a couple, three times more. Mm-hmm. And now we have a staff of three for biz dev and we've learned the lesson. We, yeah. we work salaries, we work small commissions, I mean, yep. small, uh, and they don't build up over time sure. to where, you know, where I'm saying is it's like a staircase. Like if you sign somebody up today, then two years later, three years later, you're still getting paid for that one yep. sign that just generates laziness. Yep. And so we, we just don't do it like that. They get a little nugget and it's, it's one time and done. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, I was uh, had a good feeling about this podcast just from uh, catch, checking out some of your content and just such a wealth of uh, knowledge, Brad. Uh, thanks for being on the podcast. And uh, if you guys are listening, make sure you go and check out the uh, Property Ma- Management Mastermind podcast. And that's also your website uh, is propertymanagementmastermind.com. Is that right? Yeah. Let me give you the pitch. So you can find us on the propertymanagementmastermind.com. And it's the property manager mastermind show.com or whatever you want to look at it. We have a great podcast going on. We're going on episode 37. And if you're interested in management services, we manage homes in San Antonio and Austin, Texas. Go to rentworks.com. And that's works is at W E R X? W E R X, rent, W E R X.com. All right. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Thanks again for being on the show. And uh, I know I learned a few things. I'm sure Steve did as well. Yeah. Love having you on. Yeah, hopefully uh, we'll have you on again in the uh, future. Anytime, guys. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Fred. Fred.